but you know, I think that in because there isn't really this sort of national state formation of Palestine, there are other events and other catalyzing situations that emerge that really do kind of produce a kind of unified Palestinian identity. And one of them, of course, is obviously what happened in 1947, 1948, and with the Nakba. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to ask about that in the sense of how a Palestinian identity emerged in light of these uh, events and what kind of maybe certain events that have occurred over the past cent- past century or so that have really like cemented this idea that these are the Palestinian people. Right. This is what unites them. Right. Um, one of the things that I try and argue in another book, I don't make that claim to the same extent, right? Don't push this argument mm-hmm. to that same extent in the the book that we're talking about, The Hundred Years War in Palestine. It's a book yeah. called Palestinian Identity. Mm-hmm. Is that Palestinian Identity emerges out of a, a, a number of, and the idea of modern national consciousness emerges out of a number of different pressures. Some of them going back to World War One and the immediate aftermath of World War One. Some of them going back to what happens to the Brit- Palestinians under the mandate. They see everybody else as being entitled to independence. And so you have Palestinian national congresses in the 20s and the 30s. You have a Palestinian Arab higher committee. You have an expression of Palestinian identity, which is a response to the denial of independence to the Palestinians, whereas the Jordanians and the Syrians and the Lebanese and the Iraqis are getting all of those things, and the Egyptians on the other side. So uh, that, it, it, even before the Nakba, what you're talking about, the, the expulsion of, mm-hmm. of so many Palestinians in 1948, um, which is a really important event in terms of the determining Palestinian identity. Right. You had the shaping of a, of a Palestinian identity even before that. Right. The Nakba and what happens in 1948 is obviously central. It's a traumatic event. Most of the people who lived in what becomes Israel, most of the Palestinians who lived in what was become is- in what was to become Israel after the 48 war were expelled. In fact, more people were expelled than the total number of Jews who lived there. Most mm-hmm. of the people who lived in what becomes Israel are forced out in order to create a majority Jewish state in what was then a majority Arab country. Palestine in 1948 had 66% of its population as were Arabs, and about 33, 34% were, were Jews. You can't create a Jewish state without the demographic uh, you know, manipulation, mm-hmm. bringing in more people, but also expelling some. And right. that event is, uh, it's a its a central event in modern Palestinian memory. Uh, everybody knows what happened to their grandparents or their parents. I mean, I know what happened to my parents and my grandparents. Everybody else knows what happened to them. Whether you lived in the parts of Palestine that were ethnically cleansed in 48, or whether you lived in the Gaza, what becomes the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, which were not, and where all of these refugees arrive, um, driven out of other parts of Palestine. So this is a central event shaping Palestinian identity on top of things like the great revolt of 1936-39, where 14 or 15 or 16 percent of the Palestinian Arab population are killed, wounded, imprisoned, or exiled by the British. I mean, that's going to cause a big, you know, people rose up to that extent, and so many of them are killed or wounded or captured by the British. Clearly, something is motivating them. It's not just, you know, hatred of the British. It's a sense of identity a sense that they deserve to be free of British control and free of this Zionist project that the British are Im- imposing or helping mm-hmm. to impose uh, on them. Again, so there are various signposts in the emergence of this identity. Um, and you you have a national movement back in the 20s and the 30s, and then it, it revives in the 50s and the 60s and becomes later on the PLO uh, by the 1960s, the Palestine Liberation Organization. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to, something you touched on there, I mean, the British, and then, of course, uh, bringing it up to the present, I think the main source of external support for Israel is the United States. Um, and you described that shift, um, and there it, there were some pretty distinctive events, and it was, it was interesting right. to read about that. Um, so as a way to sort of bring it up to the present moment, I do want to ask about what was it specifically, because I'm just very curious about this. It seems that, you know, at certain points, you know, the British really helped foster kind of um, this nation, this nascent uh, Zionist movement and state, this Paris state, as you described in the beginning, before it becomes a full-on recognized nation state. But uh, there were points in which the Zionist movement or, you know, the sort of uh, 
pre-Israel state or whatever revolted against, in some cases, right. revolted against the British. Right. There were moments where then the United States began to, on some level, stand almost apart from it and wonder what to make of this situation and what to do. But ultimately, of course, aligning itself very much fully with Israel. Right. There were certain events that seemed to produce that outcome to where we are today, where it's like there's really absolutely seemingly nothing that Israel can do that the U.S. will be overtly critical of. No daylight is the is the favorite expression between Israel and the United States. Mm -hmm. American politicians repeat that monotonously and without cease. There is no daylight between the United States and Israel. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're welded together in, in this vision. Uh, the change comes um, in, the, in 1939. Um, up until that point, the change, uh, let's say, between absolute British support for Zionism and a split between the British and the Zionists and a shift of the Zionist movement towards the United States and, and, and everything that follows. Um, and the shift comes in 1939 for a couple of reasons. First of all, the British have faithfully supported the Zionist movement up until this point. They've helped them to create a military force. In fact, they arm them and they train them to help put down this Arab revolt in the 30s and the in the 30 from 36 to 39. They've allowed them to elect a national, a sort of an assembly, which later becomes the Knesset. Hmm. They've helped them to create a foreign ministry. It's called the political department. And they give it international status. In other words, the the they help them to create a quasi-government called the Jewish Agency. And that has diplomatic status abroad. So they can go and speak at the League of Nations, which the Palestinians are not allowed to do. So the British have done with immigration, with land sales, with the creation of educational institutions under control of the Jewish agency, the creation of the Jewish agency itself, with facilitating land purchase, with opening immigration. The Jewish population of Palestine goes from 6% to 31% between 1917 and 1939. That's right. thanks to the British. The British yeah. control immigration. They say open immigration. At the same time as Britain has closed its own doors to Jewish immigration, and the United States right. in the 20s closed its own doors. So you have nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. Palestine is open to you, and you have European anti-Semitism culminating in the rise to power of Hitler in 1933 and increasing persecution of German and Eastern European Jews, forcing people out. And really, the only place open to them is Palestine. So the British do what they promised to do, and, and more in the Balfour Declaration and in the mandate. In 1939, something fundamental changes in British policy. And this in turn provokes this revolt on the part of the Zionists. And the fundamental change is this. The British have barely managed to control this Palestinian revolt. In 37, 38, they're losing control of the country, but they're having to worry about Europe. And so all the British, all British forces are held in reserve just in case war breaks out with Germany. Mm -hmm. When Chamberlain finally cuts a deal uh, the, in Munich with Hitler, the British are free to send forces to Palestine. They send 100,000 troops. They crush the Palestinians. But they know that World War II is coming. Everybody in England knows it. And they realize we are going to have to fight World War II as we fought part of World War I in the Middle East. And everybody in the Middle East hates us because of our repression of the Palestinians. And so you have... British, British officials in Cairo and British officials in Baghdad and British officials all over the Middle East saying, for God's sakes, this support for the Zionists is going to cause huge problems if we have to fight with Germany and Italy in the Middle East. Remember, Italy controls Libya. Italy controls parts of East Africa. Italy is aligned. Mussolini is aligned with Hitler. And they know they're going to have to fight in the Middle East. At the same time, they're getting told by their the, by the Viceroy of India and by the Secretary of State of India, Indians are enormously supportive of the Palestinians. They did not trust the Indian army to the extent that they wouldn't bring Indian troops to fight the Palestinians mm. in the 30s. Interesting. So when you look at the cabinet decisions in 1939, people in India are telling them, you've got to change your policy. People in Cairo are telling them, you've got to change your policy. So they shift their policy. They move away from the Zionists. They limit immigration. They limit land sales. They say Palestine will be independent in 10 years. It never happens. But they issue a white paper to this effect. And the Zionists are enraged. They say, you know, you've supported us and now you don't support us. And they look for alternative supporters. And they find them in Moscow and in Washington. And so you have this huge shift by Britain, followed by a huge shift by the Zionists, followed by the Americans and the Soviets, each for their own reasons, supporting 
the idea of a Jewish state in Palestine at the General Assembly in 1947. And that's where the partition resolution is born. American Soviet joint support and strong arming of smaller countries produces a resolution which gives most of Palestine to a Jewish minority. Whereas the Palestinians say, yeah, we are entitled to self-determination under the covenant of the League of Nations and under the charter of the UN, and we're not getting it. Instead, you're giving more than half of our country to this minority. And of course, the Palestinians don't accept it. It's like a Solomonic decision where 55% of the baby is given to what the other mother says is the illegitimate mother. Right. So uh, that, that's, the, that's the background of this enormously important shift by the Zionists by the British, then by the Zionists, and then by the United States and the Soviets. And that produces partition. Right. And then, of course, I suppose that, was it around the... You Actually, the, to bring you back your personal or familial connections to this, your father was in the UN when this was being discussed around, I think, the 19... Was it 1967 war? My dad worked for the UN from 1945, actually. Oh, okay. The okay. 67 war, yes, absolutely. I mean, he was working for the UN in different capacities. Right. But uh, he worked for what was called Political Security Council Affairs in the Security Council uh, at, before and during the 67 war. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there was a point in which he, you were there, I believe, and you asked him why, like, I, I remember exactly the context here, but basically you asked him why was the United States stalling or why was exactly. the US... Exactly, exactly. This know, was... Yeah. This is the fifth or sixth day of the Six Day War, of the mm. June 1967 war. And Israel had already occupied the Sinai Peninsula, defeated the Egyptian army, occupied the West Bank, defeated the Jordanian army, and was advancing into Syria mm. in the Golan Heights, mm -hmm. and had taken the heights and were advancing across the plain towards Damascus. And the Security Council was meeting to uh, issue a ceasefire resolution to stop the Israeli advance. And I was sitting there in the visitor's gallery. This was, I guess, Thursday of that week, maybe Friday, I don't remember. And um, it's in the book. And um, at some point, the resolution is tabled and, it's, and, and we're waiting for a vote. And the vote would then cause the Israelis to stop, one expects. And Ambassador Goldberg, the United States Ambassador to the United Nations, uh, asks for a recess. And I'm shocked. I say, well, that means that they're not going to have a ceasefire resolution. That means the Israelis will keep advancing mm -hmm. towards Damascus. And I wait for my father to come out after the session is over while they're in recess. And I say to him, why did this happen? And he said, well, don't you see? I mean, he didn't say it in as condescending a manner as I'm, as I'm saying it now. Don't you see? Hmm. You fool. Um, <laughs> the Americans are helping, are giving the Israelis more time to advance. Mm -hmm. And that you, you can go and look at the at the at the uh, transcripts of the meetings, and it go, the meeting then goes on for hours and hours and hours until a ceasefire resolution is finally adopted. Mm -hmm. And much after that, Israel finally stops. And this is just an example of the United States running interference for Israel uh, mm -hmm. in the UN Security Council, which it is doing to this day. There's a meeting of the Security Council this, this afternoon, I think, uh, right. Monday, December, what is it, 18th. Uh, when we're recording this. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether it's meeting. I understood it was supposed to meet. And I bet you the United States is going to do the same thing for the umpteenth time. Right. Run interference for Israel. So th this goes back to 40, 67 and actually before. Mm -hmm.